here on a rainy, soggy day. Uh, I want to welcome you to the fall 2016 kickoff uh, event for our uh, quality initiative on critical thinking. And um, essentially, I want to take the quick, very quick opportunity to uh, introduce uh, you to the team who's kind of helped guide, at least so far, uh, the work on this initiative. Um, and I'll, I'll go first here. I'm Todd Huspany in the Office of, of Academic Affairs. Um, and I'll point to my first colleague to my left. Uh, Professor Donna Warren, Professor of Philosophy, also Assistant Dean for Curriculum and Student Affairs yep. right, in the College of Letters and Science. To my right, your left, uh, Nancy Lopatin Lummis, Department of History and our Director of General Education. Uh, Vera Klikovkina, uh, Professor in World Languages and Literatures. Wade Mahon, Professor in the Department of English. And Cade, where are you? There you are. Uh, Cade Spaulding, a professor in the Division of Communication. Now, I'm um, up here. Did I forget anybody? I hope not. Paula Dehart is also a member of the team who could not be here today. Uh, in terms of a very, very brief uh, review of, of why we're all here, many of you uh, attended uh, a kind of a, a luncheon uh, that was held on two different dates in, in the spring semester. So some of you may have some familiarity with uh, what we're attempting to do on this initiative. Uh, the basic background is the term quality initiative, that's the term uh, that our accreditor, the Higher Learning Commission, uses. Um, and so I mean, we continue to use that two-letter word. But it's basically a quality opportunity, and I, and I really mean that, a quality opportunity to, to focus on what it is that we do as an institution, think about it, and how can we do it better. And that uh, essentially back to the, the, the accreditor. Um, the way accreditation is done has changed, uh, I think, much to the better in about the last decade. And so our institution is part of what's called the open pathway. And I think every UW uh, institution uh, is part of this open pathway where you go through a 10-year reaffirmation as to your accreditation. But one of the things that's new in the new and revised uh, uh, accreditation cycle is that the, the uh, essentially the requirement that an institution pick a project, something that it wants to improve uh, what it's doing. And I've seen what other institutions, even in the UW system, have done. Some, and I, I'm not making this up, some have decided to focus on the business practices and improving efficiency, and I get that. I get that. Uh, electronic forms. Uh, those are good things to do. Others have focused on keeping track of their alumni uh, for a number of different reasons in terms of measuring student success, but also probably fundraising. Uh, we wanted ours because teaching and learning is at our core. We chose to make it, and we really made it a priority that it be about teaching and learning. That's number one. Number two, that this was not going to be, not going to be something top down, but at the end of the day, faculty driven and faculty led. And those were essentially, we had the discussions with governance, we came uh, essentially uh, with a lot of different ideas, but we decided to focus on uh, essentially the teaching of critical thinking. How can we do it? How can we do it better? Are there better ways um, to actually achieve it in our disciplines? And so that's going to be my uh, essentially introductory remarks on that. You're going to hear uh, a lot more about that topic here momentarily. Basically, in terms of the objectives uh, that we have for you uh, for today, basically we want to take this opportunity for you to discuss your experiences uh, teaching critical thinking and how you may think you may uh, possibly benefit, contribute and benefit uh, from this initiative. Going to uh, have uh, Donna uh, Warren help us uh, understand uh, the elements of a specific approach, argument mapping, to teaching critical thinking. And so that will be a little part of today. Really a, a major outcome is to help you form 
uh, essentially uh, connections with colleagues who share these similar interests. And then uh, at the end of this, I'll, I'll describe. Um, basically, we've got another meeting that we've got scheduled for October and November, and I'll, I'll let you know those dates. If you have to leave early, we're going to email those out uh, as well to anybody uh, as part of the team. So did I leave anything out on that? I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Donna. And please, uh, uh, again, yeah. as long as you don't attack Donna, please feel free <laughs> to, to, to come on up and, and, and partake in the food. So uh, welcome, so thrilled to have you all here. Um, what we'd like to do now is just go to a group discussion, and I'm using a Word document so that we can actually record some results so we can share them later on. Um, thinking maybe spending about 20, 25 minutes for this, just to give you a good a sense here so we stay on track. Um, what critical thinking is uh, has been the source of a lot of debate and a lot of discussion, and I think we've decided that we really don't want to belabor it too much because the conversations can get bogged down in definitions just way too easily. But here's some understanding. I think the AACMU um, definition on, on their value rubric isn't bad, and the Fashion's definition and Hewitt's definition, I'll just let you take a look at these, but what they all have in common is the idea that critical thinking is intentional, it's thoughtful, and it has to do with making assessments of things like beliefs and justifications for those beliefs in order to guide thought and action. And when after, was it after our, mm -hmm. our book that we sent out the survey? Or was it mm -hmm. before? I think it was, yeah. We sent out the survey to the luncheon participants mm -hmm. in the spring, and we asked, we asked them, or you, what do you do to have students to demonstrate critical thinking? And I think it's wonderful to see how closely aligned what we are already doing is to <clears throat> professional understandings of critical thinking. This is my summary of what was said, and I, I collapsed some comments, but I looked over them all, and these were the main ones that showed up a lot. Um, people here are having students to analyze, summarize, and assess information and arguments. Being open to multiple perspectives was key, as was posing questions and figuring out ways to answer questions, forming judgments, um, using appropriate information, defending those judgments with arguments, and then effectively conveying those arguments. Those were common themes. So with those in mind, we then asked, what are your challenges to doing? And here, just to sort of review and maybe get our head in this a little bit, are some of the challenges. And I just want you to think about how much this resonates with you right now. Some of them have to do with where students are at or perceived to be at. And then some of them have to do with just practical limitations on what instructors can reasonably be expected to do. Students tend to be fact-focused, people say. They want to know the right answers often, and sometimes they're resistant to exploring multiple perspectives. Hence, I think, the desire to have students do that. Um, they have difficulty reading sometimes, particularly if it's long and complex. And then, probably because students tend to be fact-focused, especially early in their career, they tend to read for facts or for information, rather than for the connections between those claims. Uh, they can be both reluctant to take a stance on controversial issues, and then once they do, they can be reluctant to critically examine that stance, and they lack basic writing proficiency. So those are what, what, what was reported last spring as typical challenges that instructors face when they're trying to teach critical thinking. On the student end, on the instructor end, it's hard or almost impossible to teach course content and critical thinking all at once. That was a theme. That how on earth am I, all, how am I supposed to do critical thinking too, even as I talk about French literature or biology or chemistry or geography? Um, it's hard to give feedback on student work. And so what I said is, I mean, obviously you can if you don't sleep, eat, or have family time. The problem is, <laughs> how do you do that while maintaining a healthy work-life balance, right? Without completely devoting yourself in some sort of a martyr-like way to writing comments, which may never be read. And <laughs> instructors, <laughs> instructors are so busy with current teaching that to any, to any sort of massive course overhaul, again, interferes with well, other things you need to do, like teaching and research and service and spending time with your family and friends. So 
with that in mind, we just thought that we would open this by throwing open the, the floor for a, probably a really re reasonably brief conversation. What do you find to be most challenging to teaching critical thinking? Normally what I would have people do is talk in groups, and then we would talk in, in broader. Um, but since you're faculty, I'm assuming that you're not unduly nervous about talking about <laughs> so, um, What do you think? Yes. Um, I find there's general resistance to some of the risks associated with re-examining your perspective oh. or re-examining your position. So I have students who come in because I, many of my students are afflicted with senioritis <laughs> and um, they are kind of getting into that mindset that I, I'm confident, I know what I'm doing because they're getting ready to solve themselves. Mm -hmm. So they have a little bit of a psychological wall they put up that, no, I already know all this and I'm not going to rethink it now. Good, good. So it's kind of, it's a challenge to break down that resistance. And what, could you just tell us what your discipline is maybe and what your oh, name sorry. is? Oh, sorry, I teach business communication. Okay, good. So they're kind of ready to go out in the workplace and mm -hmm. change the world. Very good. Who else? What challenges do you find? Yes, Kim. I'm Kim. I train teachers. They're uncomfortable with the middle position on a continuum of positions. Mm -hmm. uh, a great deal of good stuff is coming into education for the bad reasons. So for instance, uh, researchers at Stanford University develop something called the NTPA that all our students have to do with an assessment. And we value the roots of it, but we're critical of the political impetus to put it into place. And they have trouble with that. How you can both honor the spirit of something while also be an activist in your own field to say this is not completely good. Okay, so would it be fair to say challenges with adopting like a nuanced stance? The, rather than they gravitate towards poles. Okay. Polar mm -hmm. ideas are much more comfortable to them than, you know, Middle ground. Good, thank you. What else? Yes. Um, from the ROTC, we struggle with empathy um, from the other person's point of view. I'm empathy? Where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. You really be able to kind of look at the other side of the coin before you can argue your position. Good, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, the first thing that I do every, I, I teach critical thinking every semester. The first day I have students write down what they want to learn in the class and why they want to learn it, and then we discuss it. And that actually shows up a lot. Students want to learn how to empathize. They want, there's a lot of talk about, I want to be able to adopt other people's points of view more easily. So this is, this is clearly in the air, something people want. What are challenges that you might face as instructors that have nothing to do really maybe with the, the, the issues with students in the classroom, besides what, what, I, what we've talked about up here, what I've already recorded. Anything above and beyond that? Yes? So I'm Pam from Communication Sciences and Disorders, and I think, and I just taught a, a course in critical thinking last spring for the first time, developed from scratch, but I never had a course in critical thinking. Yeah. So it was, am I doing this thing right? I mean, I feel like I'm a good critical thinker, but as far as making that explicit and teaching that, right. um, that's, I think, an issue. Because I think most of us probably weren't ever taught I never was. formally. I never was. I mean, I, I have my PhD in philosophy, and that's where most critical thinking courses are taught. So you would think that I would have had some, but I, I was never taught. Did anyone here get any training on how to teach critical thinking besides here on campus, maybe from me and Todd? Or <laughs> okay, ah, where? Uh, West Point and Air Force Academy. Okay, okay, good. Yes, Kim? My dissertation advisor is all about critical thinking, okay. so his course, we talked about that. And, and you did yes, too? Yes, right, in nursing, uh, University of Kentucky, we, nursing is a lot of critical thinking. Yeah. And, and one of the problems we have is one is assumption, is students get stuck in assumptions and trying to help them see that it's an assumption. Mm -hmm. ah. mm -hmm. And another thing is because we work very fast paced with patients and they move quickly, there's not a reflection of what happened. When you make, when you make it 
when you make a decision and it happens, mm -hmm. you may not see the outcome of that decision. Right. And therefore, you know, having the ability to reflect and learn from that situation. So can I say a lack of reflection yeah. upon actions or decisions? Yeah. Cool. This is a great. One more, maybe? We have one? Oh, two more. Yes, and then wait. Yes? Okay. Um, Mary Day again from SDs. I have trouble. I, te I do teach. I've taught this for 18 years, the tool and model of argumentation uh -huh. in that form. I don't know if it's you know, all in the state. But what they have trouble with is seeing the warrants. And they <laughs> sometimes don't even, um, they're not even able to perceive the assumptions that are underlying their own arguments. Right. And try yes. to get them, and they're invisible. And yes. it's kind of like talking about something that they can't see that's in the room. Thank you. <laughs> Thank so. you. I'm going to come, we're going to come back to that. <clears throat> did I spell Toolman correctly? Yeah. Okay, thought I did. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. So, this is really useful. It's nice to find out sort of what, what challenges are being faced so that we can then you know, maybe provide something that would help. And speaking of what might help, um, last spring we asked that question. Three big sorts of responses. One was providing resources, including you know, maybe even step-by-step -step methods, examples about how to change arguments to require more critical thinking. Assessment rubrics would be useful. <clears throat> Um, people said professional development sessions and workshops, and then discussion groups and concerns to share ideas. And that's partly what we want to do here, especially the discussion groups like this, and then we're hoping that we'll have some smaller groups too, some little like focused things. So how would you like to benefit from this initiative? What do you want to get? I mean, you're all here in this room probably because you want something. What do you want? Best case scenario, what do you want? Yeah, Mary? Uh, I just am looking forward to the opportunity to, to talk cross-disciplinarily um, about what forms of critical thinking people are doing in, in other classrooms, especially those of us who teach foundation level mm -hmm. and the courses like in, in, in sophomore composition, we talk a lot about argument. It would be nice to know, you know, if you go into this kind of course, this is what kind of argument you might run into, and this kind of course, this kind of argument you might run into. Good. So we're kind of we can build on what each other is doing rather than in our own style. Yeah, and that's certainly one of the guiding principles of this initiative is if we don't all have to reinvent the wheel each time, it might help because then we can maybe scaffold some skills. So we have the desire to, to implement something that will allow scaffolding while still um, enabling maximum variation between faculty and courses, right? So we're trying to hit that balance. What else would, would you like? What do you want? Besides more coffee, which we don't have. <laughs> well, I think I mean if if you found a way to teach cross, uh, uh, you know, something like critical thinking, and you adopted it at the campus, uh, you wouldn't have to introduce it every. You know, like if the idea I was going to teach it in course X, I don't have to introduce it if it's something that's introduced. You know, as soon as students set foot on this campus. You know, like I mean, if a student is familiar with a certain way. <coughs> in which something is taught on a campus, then mm -hmm. you, know, you, you save yourself time down the road because you, know, you say we're going to do activity X and the format is, is right. there. I mean, the students rec uh, recognize it right away. I yeah. think it just makes yeah. it easier and easier. I think that would make for better, easier teaching and much better learning right. because I think mm -hmm. the literature has shown that you have to teach for transfer. Yeah. You can't just teach something and expect students to transfer as much as you would like to. What's another thing you'd like to learn or get out of this? What do you want to get? Well, that's good, I suppose. Yes. Are you talking to them? No, no, no. I I need to learn how to teach them to see things that aren't visible to the eye. It's, if it's a a page in black and white, they can get it, and it's the subtler forms of perception that they seem to struggle with. So, and I'm not always good at getting them to see beyond what's right for them. Is that, does that tie into the assumptions, things yeah. that they're taking for granted? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and logic. You know, is there lines of logic that are apparent to me that are not obvious Good. to others? So I don't know how to explain. Good, excellent. 
Yes? So I'm Jenny. I'm not faculty. I'm academic staff filling in for a variety of things. And one of the things that we do is an activity that actually does the opposite of showing them that there are things that are there that are in front of your face that you're not seeing. So um, that kind of opens their eyes to, oh, I have my rose-colored glasses on because this thing, you know, is really there, and I've never noticed that it was uh -huh. there, and that sort of opens the door for other perspectives because they recognize that they didn't notice in the first place. That's interesting. Can you give an example? Um, if I had my materials with me, no, yes. that's okay. But I was just wondering. So, so very, very quickly, um, maybe some common examples out of art that I don't use, but you could is. Um, there's pictures of, you know, an old woman, and then the young woman is a stereotypical kind of thing. Oh, right. Okay, good. And then there's logos, for example, that I, this is one I do use from FedEx, the <coughs> tracking company that has a big old road arrow in the logo of FedEx. And most people don't even see it or know that it's there, but once you point it out to them, you're never not going to see it anymore. So just okay. things like that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Man, I want to Google the FedEx logo. <laughs> I never noticed that before, but as soon as this is over, I'm looking at the FedEx logo. <laughs> so, yes? Yes? Um, I'm, I'm Karen Gaskin, engineering, um, and th this, is, this is my own. Uh, I'm coming to this thinking that the types of critical thinking that we expect our students to generate in STEM fields, it might be a bit different than in many other fields. Good. And I want and I want to figure out whether that whether I'm just you know deceiving myself or or what kinds of, of tools there might be to to assess the types of critical thinking that we're after. Good. STEM versus art. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to read more about that, like particularly in the sciences. Um, what that's like. And there are people who are adopting this method for the sciences, um, but I, I'm not an expert in that. Yeah, good. In fact, that's why I'm very happy to have a whole bunch of different people, because uh, it might, I mean, I sort of want to go where the facts, I think we all do, where the facts lead us. Mm -hmm. If there's a way that works for everybody, all the better. Right, because then we can we can leverage that in various ways and disciplines. If there's not, the last thing any of us want to do is to make this like a procrustean bed that everyone has to fit in. Right, that's not the point. It's right now just it's it's actually that's what we call it faculty exploration group rather than faculty ex, you know implementation teams. <laughs> this is it's fangs not fits. Good. <laughs> so, what are you doing right now? to teach critical thinking? And what do you think might be working? Come on. Don't I have a, sorry about this. I thought I had a bullet point, but I guess I don't. What are you doing right now? What are you, oh, here it is. What are you currently doing to teach critical thinking in your classes? Yes. Taylor Eason in uh, History and International Studies. Um, just as a, 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 a quick and easy example, um, you know, I'm dealing with, uh, you know, students in History 101, and they're just sort of in that fact mode mm -hmm. like we were talking about before. And so kind of the fundamental thing that you have to do in an introductory level course like that is introduce them to two different arguments, right? So you try to find arguments that are on the opposite side of an issue, or at least two different, if not opposing, uh, interpretations of a particular figure or a particular historical event, because it's so very easy for them to just get into the mode of, okay, now you're going to tell me what happened, and now I need to remember what happened, mm -hmm. and then when you give me a test, I'm going to have to tell you what you told me happened. Oh, especially <laughs> history. Right? Especially history. Yeah. I mean, sometimes philosophers bemoan the fact that students come to college not knowing what philosophy is. And that is a shame, because we tend not to get many freshman majors. But I say, <laughs> it would be worse to have them come thinking that they know what the discipline is and being wildly mistaken. And I always hold up history as an example, right? <laughs> because I would imagine that that's the case often. That the point is to learn the dates. Well, there's a history channel. 
Yes. Which is a big part of the problem. Thankfully, not yet there's no philosophy channel. <laughs> 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 so what else are you doing? People doing to help. Yes. We look a lot at um, the second, third, fourth order effects of the decision that they would potentially make. So we ask a question, and then they give an answer of what it is after they carefully reason it out. And then we start kind of picking it apart what may or may not come to be because they made that particular decision. Okay. Which may not necessarily be what they were originally intended to make. So not just the, when you said first, second, and third effects, you mean like if you do this, this will happen, and then this will happen, and, and then, then this will happen? My potentially happen in different ways. What will happen will happen in ripple effects? What will happen in Look at look at dominoing effects, right? What's going to happen, and then what's going to happen? Good. Do you find that students tend to peter out after a certain point, or do they look at effects at all? We, we do. Um, I'm a naturalist. We try to look at second, third, not necessarily in the bits and pieces in the nets, you know, because it's all hypothetical questions. Right. But what are we trying to affect, and what are we trying to affect on purpose? Okay. Oh, Versus good. What could be affected on that? Oh, good. We used a, a good example of domino. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, can't eat during the day, so we go there trying to do humanitarian things. So we set up a nice meal, but we do it during the middle of the day. Good. Versus setting it up in the middle of the night. You know, one of the second, third order effects that one's a huge PR problem because mm -hmm. it's not very similar to religion. Mm -hmm. Versus the other one's a huge PR plus because now we complement the religion. That's a real. And we're trying to help the people. And they're like, oh, okay. And then, you know, here's what that is. Doing. That's a really good, yeah. That's a really good example. Anything else you're doing already to teach critical thinking? Yes, Kevin. In education, we use case studies, and I assign different students to different roles in the case study to practice the perspective of student, parent, teacher, principal. Good. Excellent. Good. In case you haven't figured out, one of the things we're, one of the things we're tracking here is to figure out how what you're doing would complement or fit within this model. So I'm really... Anything else you're already doing? Yes. Um, I use a lot of social media in that before I teach it related to the discipline, I can find something ridiculous in five minutes on social media, like that turmeric cures Alzheimer's. Okay. So let's pick apart that argument and then I'll have the real clinical case based on the same premise. And But they get buy-in because it was more interesting and fun but then oh, that's they learn the skill when we transfer it to real life. That's good. So, so the <coughs> social media is a good hook for them. Mm -hmm. I'll have to try that. That's really good. One other thing? Yes. Um, I'm Kathy, Interior Architecture, and with design, um, we're, we use for part of the critical thinking, um, the, looking closely <coughs> at the context of the design and looking at the societal and the geographical determinants that are involved. <laughs> So when you're doing in uh, a residence, it's not going to be the same in India as it is in, um, or even in America, mm -hmm. as the south as, uh, to the north. Yeah. Know. Like, when are you going to put up this, the food, right? Or in the middle of the day or in the middle of the night? Yeah, that's, that's, that's great looking at surrounding context. Excellent. So thank you. Here is, and I'm going to try to bear these in mind. And in fact, I, what I invite you to do now is just to sort of continue to think about what you already do. And maybe what works well, what you wished you could do, and my kind challenge you, as we introduce really quickly argument mapping here. This is going to be really quick. Do you want me to flip the light or not? Oh, yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can find the right one. It's the one closest to us. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, some of you might have already been, you know, exposed to some of this material, some of you might not have been. And when I was thinking what would be the best way in working with, with the team to, to introduce you or to reacquaint you with some of this, I first thought, well, you know, obviously learn by doing, right? Yeah, I can give you little passages and have you map, which is ideally what I would do. But then I realized there's just no way on earth you have that kind of time. You just don't have that kind of time. So I thought, instead, let's think about this as a Tupperware party. <laughs> and there's a couple of things about Tupperware. The first is that it doesn't need to fundamentally change your diet. So there's nothing like threatening about Tupperware. It's not you have to put vegetarian things. You can't put your take in things. So 
think about what you're going to be seeing as Tupperware and ask, how can that fit what I already do? And more importantly, you don't need to buy the entire set of Tupperware. One piece will help. So another thing to think as we go through this is you're going to be, I'm going to be kind of like throwing a bunch of stuff, and I chose the stuff that I use in class that I find most practically useful and that I think might, um, might export well. Okay? But just think about just one or two things, maybe just one thing, right? just one thing. If you can take one thing from this, what would it be? So here's the general background. Um, as we've seen when we talked about some of the challenges that students have in both talking about it here and um, reading some of the feedback from last spring, is that students tend to not quite, I think, understand what argumentation is. And in some of the reading that I've done, I, not just me, but other people have speculated that the problem is students don't have an argument schema. What they have is the fact schema. And a schema being like a cognitive construct, I find the concept of a schema to be a very useful schema. A schema <coughs> is a concept, it's, it's like a cognitive construct that organizes information. So the idea of like chess moves, chess masters, don't just know the particular moves of the chess pieces, but they're able to recognize patterns in ways that people who aren't chess masters simply can't do. So when they look at a chess board, they get more information out of it. They're organizing it more effectively. That's what a schema is. And many people speculate that <coughs> students just have not developed, well, a fluency with argument schema. So they tend to look at claims, but they tend to overlook the connections between the claims. And when they look at the claims, they evaluate them as claims detached from other claims, where they ask things like true or false, not supported or, well, or not well supported, which depends upon their connections to other claims. So argument mapping is a way to visualize arguments to help students to get the scheme, to get the schema. And then they'll hopefully be better at doing all of the stuff that we want them to do. So, here is an example of argument maps. The nice thing about maps is there's only a few relationships between ideas that are possible. I'm throwing them all at you right now. So you have the <coughs> relationship with one idea supporting another. This arrow is the inference. And I'm just using numbers here because they're easy to type, you know? <laughs> it's not math. It's just they're easier to type than shapes and stuff. So this is this supports this. In, in a passage, it would be two, therefore one, or one becomes two. Then we can have this relationship where we have like a train. Three is supporting two, two is supporting one. We can have two and three working together to support one, working independently. Then we can have missing stuff. You know, maybe, this, maybe this isn't stated, but it follows from these two claims. Maybe this isn't stated, and by the way, this is an assumption. This can also be probably a warrant in the Toulmin's model. It's not stated, but it's there. And then we can have these relationships where if an in, this is an inference arrow, so the idea is two is being given as a reason to believe one. I call these outference arrows. So three is a reason to disbelieve two. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an objection. And you can object to ideas stated or implied. So just an example here how this would look in English sentences. There we have some examples. And by the way, this is going to be on the D2L site. So you can read over this at your leisure. But I mean, just do this one for example. Online classes allow students to work their own pace, and <coughs> students learn better when they can work their own pace, so online classes help. Compare that with this. Um, traditional students should be discouraged from taking online classes. After all, online classes retard social integration because such classes can be completed without meeting other students. If you take a look at the difference in the relationship between ideas two and three here and ideas two and three here, that's hard for many students to see in my experience. It's really hard. That here, these, these two ideas are related as a support relationship. This is like a cooperation relationship. They're different. So part of this is just to help students to see, literally visualize, literally see that there's different ways that ideas can be related to each other, and arguments are not lists of sentences. Arguments have structure. 
comments so far? Questions so far? Um, sometimes people will say, if you go back to here, a, a, a natural and a really good objection um, that I had a hard time until recently rebutting or responding to would be a better expression, I suppose, is that all of these arguments are very short, very simple, very sweet. The structure is easy to identify. And the kinds of materials that we want college students to be able to engage will be much more sophisticated than this. And that's absolutely true. And so then, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to see how we can go from point A to point B, uh, having students actually engage the stuff you want them to read in, say, an upper division geography or political science class. Because in real life, in a passage, you're going to have some sentences that you're just going to ignore. You don't pay attention to every sentence when I'm reading a book or an article. Um, sometimes I'll need to take sentences apart or summarize groups of sentences. Um, students have a difficult time tracking an inference. I think partly because they tend to be plain readers. So I, when I'm first helping students to see these, I really overuse words like therefore and because, because I want them to see that. But in real life, those words won't always be there. And then sometimes things will just be written poorly. So how will helping students to do this help them in real life. And then um, I had a wonderful experience last summer. This is a true story. My neighbor has chickens. And um, I love the chickens. And the chickens are, are free range. And I asked her before she got the chickens, will you be eating the chickens? Because I didn't want to get emotionally attached to the chickens. If they were no, not eating the chickens. Great. So I got to know the chickens, and the chickens are running around in my backyard, and it's, it's wonderful, and, and it's a lot of fun. So I was late one night. It must have been about 11 o'clock. It was dark, and it was in the summer. I was upstairs 